Thank you all for coming today. So um, I, I call this talk uh, a little bit pregnant, and it's, it's a talk about uh, regulation and technology, and particularly one regulatory mode of technology that seems to me that it looks at the outset like it's just a, a kind of small step that you're taking, but actually on closer examination turns out to be a lot more drastic. So the talk starts with, with asking about what uh, a series of technological problems have in common. Uh, first, that um, Viacom demands that Google crack the AI barrier and invents a machine intelligence that can detect copyrighted movies as soon as they're uploaded to YouTube and then take them off. Second, that Ofcom demands that mobile phones be designed in such a way that they can't be deliberately or accidentally modified to interfere with air traffic control or emergency radio. Uh, third, uh, uh, southern states like Alabama outlaw sex toys. Uh, fourth, uh, the police outlaw devices that can convert semi-automatic weapons to fully automatic weapons. Uh, next, that the uh, MHRA prohibits manufacturing superbugs or other compounds without, uh, without uh, appropriate safeguards. Next, that a, a patent holder demands that certain mechanisms be produced under his license, or not at all. Uh, next, Scotland Yard asks an ISP to prevent child pornography or terrorist plots from traversing its networks. And finally, Vodafone wants to stop you from taking your subsidized uh, handset to another party. And the thing that all of these have in common is that they're all current or near future examples of regulating general purpose computers and networks. So that's by way of introduction. Today, I'm hoping to, to kind of get into some meaty questions about regulation. Uh, first, some, some background on what I think of as the two major modes of technological regulation uh, and why we regulate. So we, we regulate theoretically to achieve some end. For example, we might say we'd prefer that people not come to physical harm. And in that, to that end, we have two different modes that we use to approach regulation. Uh, the first is one that if it were um, publishing, we'd call it prior restraint. Uh, which is to say that we, we designate classes of, of objects or technologies that you're simply not allowed to make or whose manufacture is limited or, or constrained in some way. Um, but uh, uh, we, we don't say, um, so we might say you're not allowed to, to own a gun except in limited circumstances and some guns are completely off limits. You just can't own them at all. But what we don't say uh, and what we don't subject to prior restraint is every object that might be used to bring someone to harm. Um, that's impractical for at least two reasons. The first being that the regulatory cost of regulating every object that could cause physical harm would be very high. You'd have regulators in charge of ensuring you never put a roll of money uh, change inside a sock or picked up a piece of gravel or a stick. Uh, and people who legitimately wanted to own a length of rope or a crowbar or a bottle of bleach would have to go through all sorts of regulatory hurdles just to do the things that are part of everyday life. And secondly, uh, and this is very important, it wouldn't work. Uh, a bad person who genuinely wanted to hurt someone would have no trouble uh, improvising or locating a device that could, could cause some harm. Um, and no amount of regulation would also stop someone who's sufficiently clumsy or thoughtless from leaving a ladder where someone might trip over it or leaving a length of rope where it shouldn't be. So that sort of harm that arises from general purpose technology, we don't uh, regulate by prior restraint. Instead, we tend to regulate it after the fact. Um, you're allowed to own all kinds of potentially lethal objects, um, but if, uh, from, from bandsaws to cricket bats. But if you do something really naughty with them, we have new charges that we can add to the charge sheet. We, we say that you were criminally negligent, or we say that you committed assault with a deadly weapon. That kind of after the fact regulation balances out these two factors of, of the, uh, the complexity of, of, of regulation and the likelihood that it's going to succeed. Um, objects that are general purpose are considered bad candidates for strict regulation because on the one hand there are lots of legitimate uses for them and on the other regulation probably won't stop dedicated people from using them for bad things. Which brings us to the general purpose computer. Historically, we've thought of computers as being special purpose devices, more like a handgun or an automobile than a cricket bat or a bandsaw. Um, and that's, for one thing, they're very complicated. 
and we think of complicated things as being pretty specialized, not least because the number of people who can make them is, is relatively small, so they might be regulatable. We might be able to approach all the people who know how to build a complicated device and ensure that they know what the rules are for building it. And they're also expensive, or at least computers used to be, and it's easier to regulate devices that cost a lot of money than devices that cost pennies, because when multi-million pound objects change hands, um, that tends to attract attention. It's a place where a regulator might notice something is happening. It's momentous, as opposed to things that cost pennies changing hands, which happens all the time and would require a lot of regulatory oversight to detect every instance. Um, but it turns out that the expense and bulk of computers was an extremely temporary condition and that every year has seen an accelerating trend to computers becoming cheaper, smaller, and more powerful. And it also turns out that the special purpose character of computers was just a temporary blip, where we might have once purpose-built a computer from the ground up to act as, a, act as a file server or a ballistic system or a weather predictor or something to break codes, a uh, television, a video game system, or a screen reader for visually impaired people. Today, we just throw the same commodity hardware at all of these problems. It's the cheapest and most efficient way to solve almost any computational problem that we face today. Just use general purpose hardware. And increasingly, we're realizing that many of our problems are computational. When, when you've got a big hammer that gets bigger, cheaper, and faster every year, everything starts to look like a nail. So we started to think of everything from carbon emission to psychology, education to urban planning as being problems that have some computationally tractable dimension. Um, the universal character of computers is a feature and not a bug. It's, it's not something that we're doing because it's just uh, it's ex it's exigent circumstances. It's because when everyone gets together and agrees that making one tool faster, better, and cheaper solves all of their problems, well, then the amount of resource that we can pour into making that thing faster, better, and cheaper uh, b increases, and so everyone gets the benefit of it. And of course, g this general purpose character isn't limited to computers. It's also a characteristic of the, of the network as we know it today. Uh, networks used to be, of course, very specialized. We had one for cable tele, and one for mobile phones, and one for, for landlines, and one for emergency services, and one for faxes. I mean, faxes are a really interesting example here for all that every now and again the bank wants you to send them a fax. Um, it's, it's pretty remarkable from this, from this vantage point to consider that we once maintain an entirely parallel set of network infrastructures and endpoints for the sole purpose of moving around low purpose uh, bitmap or low, low uh, resolution bitmaps. I mean, that's, a, that's a, an amazing thing to consider from this distance where today the idea of rolling out your own device for something that narrow seems pretty um, bizarre. Um, but as the early net heads told the early bell heads, the internet is the protean universal network that can treat voice, video, games, telemetry, and remote surgery, and anything else you can imagine as mere applications, just layers that can be stuck on top of the same common infrastructure. And as with the general purpose computer, general purpose networks have seen tremendous investment and improvement because nearly everyone wants them to be faster, better, more reliable, and cheaper. A faster net improves the life of everyone from TV watchers to telephone talkers, readers and writers, filmmakers and librarians, dentists and bricklayers. So anyone with a credible inkling for improving general purpose networks has no trouble finding investors, finding people to work on the project and so on. And so this accelerating return has not only been visited on the computer, but also on the general purpose network. You can find out more about research and courses in some of the technologies discussed in this seminar by going to www.mct.open.ac.uk.